receiving it from the Queen. Peter Rodrigues, the cup for Southampton. Certainly Crystal Palace, it's got to be said, have brought a romance and excitement again to the FA Cup this season. But their day looks to be done now, as the referee again looks at his watch. And it's all over, and Southampton are through to Wembley. Well, it was after, it was after the semi, and we were in the dressing room afterwards, and Shannon just said, you know, now we're there, we, it's no good being there, we've got to win it. You know, if, if you get beat in a cup final, no one, no one knows your name. If you finish second in the league, no one knows who you are. If you win it, everyone does. And everybody remembers it. It's history. Now it's news. Tomorrow it's history. And so one thing is all about winning, really. You get to a cup final, you've got to win them. That was the first thing I said. I said, we've got to go there and win it. You know, you know, we're not playing second fiddle to, I mean, man, you know, they were supposed to be odds on favourites and that. I, I, I just looked at their team and looked at ours. I thought, well, you know, we got a lot of a chance here. And I think that's one of the great things about the Cup this year, that whoever got through today, it was going to show the second division or the third division that they could do what the first division clubs so often do, get through to a final at Wembley. So, for the third time in four years, a second division side goes through to Wembley. We went to Selsden Park and it was the place where Sunderland had been. And it was relaxed, it was... We weren't pressured into anything. We'd got the belief that we were there and we had to give it 100%. But no shouting or screaming or anything, just a relaxing preparation. We went away for the week and the excitement, you could see building in the players, we had a relaxed week, a um, little bit of golf, training and what have you. We were going round, um, going into department stores and sports shops and, you know, making personal appearances. So on the Thursday night, before the final, I went to Laurie and I said, look boss, we're bored stiff in the rooms, there's nothing to do. And you send us to bed at 10 o'clock anyway, even if we're downstairs having a chat. I goes, is it okay if we go for a, a shandy or something and a game at darts? We were training on this luxurious lawn out, out in the hotel, which was lovely, that was excellent. And then, but we were twiddling my thumbs a bit something and Thursday night he said, right, off you go, down the pub, be professional, there's a game Saturday. <laughs> and we were, we went down with a lot of us, one out, all out, down the pub, couple of beers came home. Well, we went away. I, I needed to get them out of the way, obviously, and um, it was a very quiet area, and uh, I said, right, you can have a night out, and, and they all went out as one, and that's important. It was an area where there wasn't much drink. I think the Queen Victoria had made it that way, uh, but good old team, they found one, don't worry. On the Friday, we went to the stadium and uh, usually one team goes to the stadium and the, the other team goes when the other team's left. But for some unknown reason, Man United came to the stadium while we were there and they started to come on the pitch. So it was, it was quite unusual. So Stuart Pearson, who was a, a good pal of mine at Man U, come up and some of the other lads and we were all talking. And uh, I always remember Tommy Kavner, who was a wee chatty Liverpool guy who was, who was the assistant manager at Man U. And I remember him coming up and in front of the guys saying to me, you should be playing for us tomorrow instead of Southampton. And I remember looking at Pancho and looking at the other lads and I just straight out, I just said to him, I said, no, I says, we're going to beat you tomorrow. I says, so I'm in the right camp, I says. So I'm going to enjoy myself tomorrow. We go up for breakfast in the morning. Uh, then we went to Wembley and the bus ran over two people. Yes, that was, uh, I say, unfortunate for the guy that just stepped off the curb and, and the bus hit him and it drove on and everybody was up out of their seats looking behind us and we got into the stadium and everybody was concerned. But don't forget the old driver, bless him, 
That was the biggest day of his life, you know. The buses came around the side a little bit and the supporters were making their way in. And there was a couple of fellas, I mean, you're going slow, you're slow. And there was a couple there and they stumbled and they'd been having a drink, obviously. And he, he, the bus hit them, not hard, but it did brush them and he, he put the brakes on. And I'm looking, looking, and they got up and I had to make a decision, I said, drive on. So when we got here, I came out the tunnel and there's a big picture in a newspaper once, Tommy and me, arm on each shoulder, laughing our heads off. And there's a bubble, what were they saying? You know, nobody guessed because uh, Tommy said, where have you been, where have you been? You know, like this. And I said, oh, I said, we had a problem coming up. I said, a um, couple of fellas stumbled in front of the bus. And quick as a flash, Tommy said, who's got their tickets? <laughs> you know? you know, we went out onto the pitch beforehand and uh, um, in those brightly coloured suits, I remember that, and uh, which uh, um, was a dreadful choice, I think. Um, and I had a lot of interviews, recordings of interviews, um, myself, Shannon, Osgood, I think it was McCalliog. And the air of confidence was, was just there enough to say, wow, we believe in ourselves to win it. We weren't flash, we weren't arrogant, but we were just, this air of confidence in the interviews made me think afterwards when I saw them all, wow, we did believe we could do it. And while the introductions are going there, the eyes everywhere else move to the other end of the field. The entry of the two sides, Manchester United on the left, led by Tommy Doherty, and on the right by the six foot four, Laurie McMenemy. When we stood in the, in the um, tunnel to waiting to come out, you looked across, they were terrified. They were frightened out of their lives. So, and we were laughing, having a chat, having a joke. You could see they knew there was so much pressure on them because they, they, you know, they, were the, they were the big team at the moment, weren't they? When you walk out the tunnel, the crowd, I mean, it, it's obviously the biggest crowd you're going to play in front of. And I think, personally, all I wanted to do was get on and play. You stood around and you... It, that's when it starts getting nervous because you think, you know, look at all this, look at what's happening. And, you know, we're actually here now. Now we've got to perform and make sure we don't let ourselves down in front of all this crowd. At no time did we say or think, uh, oh, we're going to win this game, it's a, it's a piece of cake. We knew Southampton were a good side. But we also knew that if we played as well as you had been, we had been playing, we'd have beaten Southampton. But on the day, they were the better side. It's as simple as that in a nutshell. Um, when you played with the likes of an Osgood or a Shannon, um, a Peter Rodriguez or whatever, um, they always said that we can win competitions like that. I'm not sure I was always on that, that wavelength with them initially, um, but they, they believed they could beat anyone uh, on, you know, on any given day. So um, they certainly uh, knew that we could win a competition like it. The walk, the tunnel was long, long, long. You came out, the nerves were there, and it sounded like a beehive in here. 100,000 people, a, bee, a, bit, a bit of a buzz, a bit of a buzz. Referee then give the nod, and a man at the front from the FA guiding you out, walking up up the tunnel. The noise got louder, louder, louder. A wallop when you came out onto here, and whoosh, hundred thousand people. I think Peter Rodriguez said that you know he'd been there before, and uh, that was one of the things he said to us is you know make sure you take everything in because it'll be all over very quickly, and then you're if you did, if you don't you'll regret it. You didn't, I didn't need motivating on that day because an older person now coming towards the end of my career, proudest day of my life, leading that team out, being skipper, and saying to myself, take everything on board, slow everything down, and I can remember almost every minute of that day. Come to the tossing of the coin, and I, and I walked up with uh, to Clive Thomas and, and Martin Buchan, and I looked at him and he, his knees were shaking. And I just turned and I turned around to Ozzy and I said, God bless Oz. 
I turned around to Aussie and I said, the guy's shaking like a leaf and he's a Scottish international, been there, done it and all the rest of it. But they're, they're on the edge, you know, they're nervous. And the first 10, 15 minutes, yes, they were all over us like a dose of salt. 76 Wembley is almost underway. And now it is as Manchester United attacking the goal to our right. The first 20 minutes was really tough. We, we knew they'd be coming at us. And this is why, well, we all got together and said, look, we've got to concentrate and not let them score. And Ian Turner stopped a couple. We had a couple of lucky breaks. But after the first 20 minutes, that was it. They, I don't, they only had one more chance. They hit the crossbar with a header. And, but after the first 20 minutes, it was difficult the first 20 minutes. But after that, they seemed to shut down. Now it comes to Pearson. Played on the game for Hill. Onside, he's all right. Is this number one? No, pushed away there by Turner. The bubbled off me, and the only thing I can say is they didn't go in. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. I didn't feel nervous to the extent that I was making mistakes or things were going wrong. I was believing that I was stopping it more than bobbling it. You know, the back four had to be rigid. You know, if they were going to play, they weren't going to play through us, they were going to play wide of us. Um, the two, you know, um, Pedro and Peachy tight on the two, um, the two wings. And um, that was it. And as, as I said before, and I've said it many times, the first, I suppose, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, things were a bit sort of shaky. They came out, but after then, uh, I just couldn't see them scoring. Well, we knew that they were quite useful out wide. Um, Peter was, um, Gordon Neal was playing out on the, on the left, and the couple was playing on, the, on, the, on my side. And um, we knew that we had a job to do. Um, and I mean, he went off Gordon Hill, so Peter did his job, and I think I was comfortable with Copple out of one or two moments. But you're gonna, but, you know, I felt I felt comfortable on the day. The first 20 minutes, we were on the back foot all the time. Ian Turner, the young goalkeeper, I think it hit every part of his body, uh, and he he you ran out, he, he, he hands up, legs wide, and all that. And it was just a matter of time, obviously, until Man United had got a goal. Fortunately, they didn't. We then got in the swing of it, and then we played good football, and um, it could have gone either way. I was clean through, keeper to beat. Um, not quite, you know, the keeper came out to the edge of the box. So the keeper, Alex Stepney, was, was pretty shrewd. He came. I just got, I mean, I didn't get there with the ball in, under control. I got there when the balls got there. And I've just made a decision to just try and knock it by him. And he stuck out a foot, he's t he got his toe and just, just, just cleared it, basically. But it, I, it was, in theory, I was clean through, but I had clean through with, with chance of, I remember it well, with one touch. And I just thought, I'd just knock it by the side of him. And he just managed to get a toe out and, and stop it, which is, hey, listen. I've missed out thousands in my time, but I scored plenty, you know, so that was, that's just part of the game. It never bothered me that, you know, I, I was always a believer, you know, keep, never mind about missing chances, keep making them. If you, as long as you keep making them, you're going to take some. There is Southampton, the underdogs who started this cup campaign as 101 outsiders, are holding Manchester United, the red hot favourites here at Wembley, nil nil. Because I remember coming in at half time. And Laurie said to me, uh, Steely, what do you think? I said, if we score, we win. We had talked about the goal and, and when Laurie had had a team meeting, and, and my point of view to Laurie was that w what Man United will do is if they have a good clearance, they will push out. So if the ball goes in the box, Man United clears it, 20 or 30 yards, they will push up 10 yards. I've watched it on, on video time and time again, and, and oh, here it comes, here it comes. And Ian Turner, just an innocuous sort of goal kick from Ian Turner. I 
I thought it really had a help in it because the uh, um, it, Ian did a long it was the kick out and I went up at half on the halfway line to, to try and flick it on uh, and missed it and um, and it got to Jim and then Jim put um, um, Stokesy through and uh, and I just thought if I had headed it then it wouldn't have scored so we were so it's probably down to me really. But. It finished up with Jimmy McCallio playing a pass that nobody else, there's not many players in the country could have played that. They wouldn't have seen that because Jim had great vision and great skill. He wasn't the quickest in the world, but he had great skill and great vision. Well, I could see that they were trying to push out and that Martin Buckin was trying to push them out. But I also heard little Bobby on the left-hand side shouting Jimmy Mark and I heard him and I just lifted it over the top so that it didn't run on. If it had run on, it had gone through to the keeper. But I just a nice wee touch to get it over their heads and into a space where Bobby was going in the inside left position. Shannon, nice touch again. Carry on. Oh, look at this. Bobby Stokes. Hit well. Oh, he's there. Stokes has put Southampton in the lead. Roll from the back to uh, Jim McCallie, a great experience, had a little look and that helped it in. And uh, little Bobby, Bobby Stokes was a quiet lad. Um, they, all, all the players loved him. Uh, he missed more goals between the semi-final and the final than anybody. He had more opportunities, more opportunities. And uh, in my mind, I thought, you're going to score sometime. And fortunately, it was on that day. And if you look at it, I mean, people watch it time and again. The ball came in, and most people would have had two touches. One to control it, and the next one to pick his spot, and he didn't. Stokes has put Southampton in the lead. A great break there for Southampton. And they're all off that Southampton bench. Bobby Stokes, only five foot seven of him. Yes, it was a good run and he was just on side, I felt, when the ball was played. He didn't catch it very well, but like we said, Alec took him a good position, but the bad one beat him. And it sneaked just in the corner. It's, it's been threatening to happen, though. I always remember him, well, because he, he hit it early. If he hadn't hit it, if he'd give Stepney a chance and he'd got an angle, but he took it straight away, Bobby, and by then, Stepney hadn't got his angle, so, and it just went in the corner. He just found the right spot. It was just the right time just killed the game and then carrying on a bit further we just kept the ball so that was all we had to do was was just keep the ball and and play out time we thought we had won you know we nearly gave a goal away straight away didn't we they should have scored you know from the kickoff if you watch the video because we're still celebrating and we've got back they've kicked off and they broke away and Ian made a great start but now look at the other end here Turner is through and saving it there the broke, and I blocked it. I can't. Was it Jerry Daly who got in the in the box, and we blocked it. Now was the time where we'd actually got a goal, and now we had to defend. If we didn't let anything in, we've won the cup. And I think that's when it really comes where it becomes a matter of basically life or death. You're going to commit yourself 100% to everything to make sure that nothing is going to go past you. It was the longest seven minutes of anybody's life, I'll tell you. Uh, and I think most of us couldn't believe it. I mean, the crowd, they were in awe of it. And uh, of course, when the whistle went, fantastic. Great. In all fairness, 10 minutes to go, I kept looking up at the Queen and the cup was about that big. I'm thinking, oh, no, no, or oh, at 1-0, could be up there in a minute, you know. And I think when we scored, I thought it was about 20 minutes or so to go, 25 minutes to go, you know. So I think, oh, we're going to hang on, hang on. And then, literally, I didn't realise it was so, you know, so much, you know, so close to the end that um, and the whistle went. I, you know, I just, it was just a relief. It was just, um, um, we didn't have to go through all that long, you know, last 20 minutes holding on but um, it was uh, elation really I think. Went out for a goal kick I always remember and uh, Clive Thomas was the referee 
and uh, I was uh, walking alongside him on the edge of the box as Ian was putting the ball down and uh, he said, uh, how do you feel Dave? I says, Clive, I'm shot, I've had enough now, it's like blow your whistle. He said, well you've just won the cup final. And uh, well, you don't forget those words, do you? A half a minute of injury time already played. And they've done it! Southampton have won it! Bobby Stokes' his goal has done it! Laurie McMenemy, emotional tears there. The underdogs have confounded them all. And Mike Shannon and Bobby Stokes celebrate there at Wembley. And look at those scenes of joy. Ian Turner, who was in trouble early on, but survived it all. Mel Blythe, the big number five, and the number two, the skipper Peter Rodriguez on a free transfer a year ago. Tom Doherty coming out with dignity, knowing perhaps that he's been beaten by a better side on the day that did their homework so well. Well, when he blew the whistle, all I can remember doing is running over to Peachy and rolling on the floor. <laughs> and then afterwards, you're thinking, well, why did you do that? But it was just the excitement, the adrenaline was running out of you that you've actually done this, you've actually won the FA Cup. And especially, not fancied, second division club against a, a club that was well fancied. And as I say, I can only remember rolling on the floor with Peachy. I'll tell you the first thing I did, I think, I mean, after, you know, hugs and cuddles, you always shake hands with the other manager and Tommy Doherty took it very, very well. I turned round and I looked up at that Royal Box. I mean, the Queen obviously was there. And um, our directors were lined up along and I looked at them. I mean, I didn't do any of this or whatever, but I looked at them and I was really saying, thank you for standing by me. My first year, we got relegated, third bottom, first team to go down three bottom. Uh, and I think they realised, we went down with more points than they'd stayed up with two or three years. They realised 18 year period of Ted, changes had to be made, Ted knew that. And they had enough trust in me to let me, and they stood by me. These days I'd have been out the door. Um, and I looked at them and I, I, I was absolutely delighted for every one of them. They were lovely gentlemen. Many of them had businesses in the area and they represented the man on the terrace. They didn't take anything out of the club and in the old days they'd actually put money in when it was needed. And uh, I really, that was my first thought for them. And then I could see my family, my wife and that. You know, and I think you then try to soak it all in. But it's something which is <clears throat> completely different and new. You know. An unbelievable result. Peter Rodriguez cast on the heap and nobody really wanted to know a year ago until Laurie McMenemy snapped him up. After a magnificent season, Manchester United have neither won the cup nor won the league. I still see it to this day. Looking at it, the guy collects the cup um, and that is the ultimate. And I, I remember being down at Supporters Club a couple of years ago at the Dell. No, at St Mary's. And uh, had the guy, the, the commentator was sort of, uh, the DJ was asking me various questions and Pete, was meeting the Queen the greatest day of your life? And there was a bunch of Saints supporters all in their red and white stripes stood in front of me. I said no. And they all stepped forward. And I thought, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. That was fine, that was a lovely part of the day. I said, but to collect the cup from the Queen, turn half a metre, raise the cup up and show you guys, that was the greatest day of my life, to do that. And receiving it from the Queen, Peter Rodriguez, the cup for Southampton. That's brilliant enough to get to things like that, but to have them to win it, it's another thing. And there goes Southampton on that lap of honour. And in fairness 
to them. The Manchester United fans are giving them a good reception. Jim McCallie on number 10. <laughs> Ian Turner was the goalkeeper there. Well, they were saying and they were going through the motions of saying that they thought they could win it. I wonder if they really believed it. And I wonder if they can really believe it now. Just look at the smile on the face of Mel Blythe and Peter Osgood, and Jim Steele as well. I remember coming out of the doors, and uh, my a friend of mine, Brian, had uh, parked my car in the uh, thing in the car park and, and as I'm walking I, c I can't remember my feet touching the floor before I um, got to my car. My car must have been three or four hundred yards away from the actual stadium and the crowd and you've you got big guys crying. I mean I don't know whether that was for, through beating Man United or um, or actually because we, we, we'd actually won it you know. Well just after the game when the final whistle goes uh, I shook hands with a big lot of it, and I felt I haven't done enough. And I said, that wasn't nice, that wasn't enough, he deserves better than that. And when I was in the hotel at King's Cross after the game, I thought, I'll give the big man a ring. I said, hello, Tommy Dock here. I said, oh, Tom, this is like about seven o'clock, half past seven after we'd beaten them here. Hello, Tom. Uh, he said, right, just want to say well done. I said, dear me, Tom, come on out. He said, no, nah. he said, if I couldn't win it, I'm pleased you did. I said, oh, my neck, Tom, that's, that's amazing. That. Oh, he said, I'm crying. I'm crying. Uh, I said, Tom, I hope you'll win it next year. When you lose to nice people, which the people at Southampton are, not were, are lovely people. And Laurie's a great friend of mine, a great mate, even during and before and after the game. You know, to get beat, disappointing, but when it's a nice fella that beats you and a good team beats you and a good crowd of players, uh, it makes life much easier for you. Hey, we, we all had a few drinks. We, all, we were all together. We went on to a, to a nightclub and what have you, but we were pretty knackered. You know, one time we'd been, the whole build up to the game and everything else, then the game itself and the aftermath and then what have you, then we all, all went to the, like a, a reception that we had and, and that. But then, we, you know, we all went out, but, I, I, you know, we were, we were sort of working on fumes, you know what I'm saying? There was nothing, there wasn't a lot of energy left, you know? And then the next day we go back to the Dell and then, then it took off. I said, do what you want, but tomorrow morning, bump, nine, ten o'clock, well, I had to go and do a TV, ITV, I remember I did that. Came back on the bus and away we went. Uh, I think the manager of the Royal Garden wanted to come, James Brown. He was a Southampton man. People like that on the bus. And uh, everybody's sort of half asleep. We're coming out, even out of Hammersmith and before London, and people are saying, look, in them little bridges, there was people on cheering. Coming down to Eastleigh on the approach, the bridges, bunting, flags, scarves, all that. And he said, whoa, hello. <laughs> You can see all the houses where the trees weren't grown at that point, had their decorations up, and you think, wow, this is, we've arrived, as it were, you know, it was, that was the start of it, approaching Eastleigh. Every bridge, I mean, we weren't even near Southampton, every bridge, bridge had a Southampton uh, shirt hanging over it with people going, come on, say We just couldn't believe it, it was fantastic. Uh, in, the, in the morning, I had to get down there. I can remember Laurie saying to me, whatever you do, make sure you get down there at a certain time. I can't, uh, maybe 10 o'clock or something like that. And I can remember, and, I, and I've said it many times, I can remember actually coming down, I forget the name of the, the long drive down to this sort of, the last roundabout, uh, as you're coming into Southampton. But I can see it. I mean, the, the cars are bumper to bumper. And, I, and uh, my, uh, my ex said, uh, we're not going to make it. And I'm driving and I'm going, jeez, Laurie would go potty, you know. We, obviously, you wanted all the lads on the bus. And we were leaving from the Dell then to drive round by the coach. And as I'm driving and I'm honking my horn and um, 
saying a few choice words, and there's no way I'm going to reach the uh, the the last roundabout before you come into Southampton, and, and all of a sudden I can see this big guy getting out of the car, a few cars up, and he's coming down. He's giving me real verbal and as he's coming down, and and as he's getting nearer and nearer me, he's going cursing blind at me and he's going blah 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 oh it's Mel Bly get out of the way he's got to get back to the ground he's lit that room that uh, I can uh, remember every time I think about it that particular I've never met the guy since um but yeah did and, he get uh, you there on time sorry did he get you there he get he got me there on time all the cars moved out he got all the cars moved out we went round the other way other side of the roundabout to get to the Dell. I didn't know there was that many people in Southampton. That's the truth. Everywhere we went, it was absolutely chock a block. We went all around town, and there wasn't a, there wasn't a space. And all these people were cheering us that we'd done some for the city. They put they put on a bus for for us to go around the city, which they said would take maybe 30 minutes, it took four and a quarter hours. I mean, it was just, you couldn't, you, you couldn't move with the bus. Hey, do you see that one? Stokes is no hope. No hope. <laughs> Do you know something? It's I only re you don't really realise just how much this club means to some people. Sometimes I I realise that that was part of it that bit, but up until then you don't. You go out and play your game. You make mistakes. You get shouted at. You get patted on the back when you win or play well. But it was when I finished football and actually in my job and then meeting supporters and actually like we're doing now having a chat how much the club means to them some da real dire some of the guys are play golf in now some big Saints fans and other they, they love they love the club absolutely adore it you can think god you can, just can't believe it you'd probably put a little bit more, if you'd have known that you'd have put a little bit more effort in I think to when you were playing just how much it means to them it was Ozzy me and Stokesy and we got Stokesy you go and talk to the guy uh, that was looking after the FA Cup. And then Ozzy went and said to the guy, uh, it's, it's okay if I have a picture with it, just to be on top of the steps here. He went, yeah, yeah, no problem, Peter. And, and I was in the car at the bottom of the steps. <laughs> we got in the car and took off. And first we went to the Drummond Arms, where I was actually living then, because I'd split up with my wife. And Jimmy McGowan, was the landlord, and he was the next Saints player, Jimmy. So we went in there with FA Cup, and they're going, oh, Stu, what have you done? I said, oh, exactly. well, have a drink of it then. So he put, he put a load of lager or whatever in it, and we all had a drink at the FA Cup. And we said, come on, let's go downtown. So Ozzy and me went downtown to the centre of town, in the square there, and there was, they had a burger van. So I said, oh, I'll need to get something to eat. So we went a couple of burgers, and he went, Oh, and they recognised us, of course, and he said, oh, it must be fantastic. Oh, hold on, we'll get it. Ozzy went and got out of the back of the car and we had coffee at the FA Cup. I was going home that night and I was with Brian O'Neill because we lived out at Bishop's Waltham. And we stopped at the, he says, oh, he says I'm going to have a burger on the way home. So we stopped and the fella said, you can have whatever you want tonight, lads, you want. He says, I've just had a drink out of the FA Cup. And I said, you yeah, what? He says, Ozzy's just been by with the FA Cup. <laughs> he says, and he brought it in there and he said, we had a drink at the FA Cup, so you lads can have whatever you want. The phone went, I'm still in bed. Uh, manager, and I recognised the chairman's voice. And when he called me manager, I thought, I had a problem. I said, yes, chairman, where's the so-and-so cup? I said, the cup? He said, you know that cup? I said, oh, I said, it's... I don't know, it'd be back at the club. It's not, it's missing, find it, and put the phone up. 
So I've gone, well, dear me, what's happening? And I rang Keith Honey, and Keith, was, he, he, he was feeling guilty because he'd gone home. So anyway, I got to the ground early because the players were coming in, and um, I had a, an office. There was a, a door, a passage in the old dell. You came in, turned right, you opened a door here. There's a little room, and then another little door, and I was in that bit there. So this first bit was empty. I heard the outside door open, then I heard a clang, 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 clang. So I got up, come and I heard footsteps running. So by the time I got there's the cup lying there, the base lying there. And I've opened the door, can't see anybody. And then the following day, George Horsfall came in and says, uh, Laurie wants to see you too. Because Ozzy had come in and put the FA Cup in front of the door, in front of the manager's door. So he said, the boss wants to see you too. And I'm going, oh. So we went into the office and he goes, uh, you should never have stole the FA Cup. We said, it was just a joke. We were going to McGowan's. You know Jimmy, he used to be the ex player. And he went, yeah. And we, we knew we were OK because Ted Bates was killing himself laughing, standing behind Laurie. So we knew we were all right. He went, right, oh, get lost. So <laughs> that was it. These are moments that they'll never forget. Is the only tinge of sadness when you look back that, that Bobby and Ozzy aren't still here to, to look back on this anniversary as well? Great lads. Great lads. No two ways about it. Ozzy, Ozzy kept, kept the side together in lots of ways because my lasting memory of uh, Ozzy is a glass of Chardonnay. Sat on his stool in the pub holding court with his mates and we used to pop across and see him there and, and whenever we did Bum, 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 bum. Straight on the phone. Staley, Pedro's here. Boom. Mel, Pedro's here. And he would just keep people in touch like that with the club. And just a lovely person. One of, one of the, as, as footballers, one of the top footballers' friends that I know. Stokesy, little gentleman. Walk across the room to say hello. You know, no airs and graces with Stokesy. Lovely man, very subdued, quiet, good striker of a ball. Obviously proved that in, in, in the cup final when he scored the goal. Uh, like I say, Ozzy was my best mate and Stokesy was really close. Because, well, when, before Peter came here, Mick Shannon, Bobby Stokes, myself and Brian O'Neill would all go to Fontwell races and he'd always have a crack at the races. But, uh, ah, I mean, if we won, Shannon would be rolling his fist out the window. I mean, the one, one day we went to Fontwell, and I think it was Bobby and Brian. They had bet this horse, and it was about 10 lengths in front, and they're all cheering away, cheering away. Then it fell at the last fence. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, they got beat, they lost the money. And, uh, Stokes, he said, that's rubbish. He said, I could jump that fence. And Mick goes, go on then, see if you can jump the fence, because it was the last race. So <laughs> Bram and Brian went and tried to jump the last fence. They actually jumped it, but they came out and there were all scratches everywhere all over them. We had a laugh going home. You two idiots. Ozzy uh, was with me when I was at uh, Chelsea as a young kid. Um, so we were kids together. I remember the first time I played with Ozzy, I was in a youth cup match. I, I didn't know who he was. Uh, we played a youth cup match at um, West Ham and uh, we won 5-2 that night. Ozzy got two and I got two. Um, so he goes way back to the beginning of my professional career and uh, loved the guy, smashing man, terrific guy. And we, Bobby, you know, fantastic for him to score the goal. Local lad. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be thinking about him. A half a minute of injury time already played. And they've done it! Southampton have won it! Bobby Stokes, his goal has done it. Larry McMenemy, emotional tears there. The underdogs have confounded them all.